I want to welcome you all today to the, the first of our policy panels uh, on behalf of the Energy, uh, Environmental Energy Study Institute, EESI, that is the, the core sponsor of this event, uh, with the Sustainable Energy Coalition. I am Scott Sklar. I'm chairman of the steering committee of the Sustainable Energy Coalition. I have a 17-year-old company that blends all forms of renewables and efficiency globally for the last 17 years. And I teach three interdisciplinary courses on sustainable energy at the George Washington University. We have a great panel today. And I do have to apologize because the head of EESI has uh, had a little uh, accident. And I have to uh, introduce uh, a senator in about five minutes. So I'm going to let this panel go for 10 minutes autopilot. But we have four <laughs> great people here. And I hope they control themselves. And by the way, we are webcast today. So don't, don't do anything violent or uh, untoward, because you will be totally categorized on the, on the uh, catalog on the web forever. Uh, we have a great panel to start off and on public policy and sustainable energy. We have Sue Gander, director of the Environment, Energy, and Transportation Division of the National Governors Association. We have Joe Heiser, professor of the practice, Carnegie Mellon University, Wilton Scott Institute for Energy Innovation. We have Andreas Kramer, founder of the Ecologic Institute, Mercator Senior Fellow, Mercator Foundation, and Mary Alice Fisher, Certification Program Director, Low Impact Hydro Power Institute. So we got a wonderful gamut. Now, my instructions to this panel, since we are limited in time and I would like to sneak in some questions, is that you are to speak for 10 minutes. And if you go over 10 minutes, I want the other panelists to, to like put their thumbs down or something like that. <laughs> You're going to also uh, signal them, too. So when this woman starts signaling you like crazy, you just stop dead, because we want to get a few questions in. So with that, Sue, you may take over. I will be back in five. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, great to be here today, and I'm excited to be on this panel. Um, I hope you'll take a few moments after or in between some of the speeches to go by and visit the expo down the hall. And Jay has a table there where we are sharing our story maps around energy transformation. These are multi-layered um, visualizations of what's going on in states across the country around energy. And um, that includes things like solar, wind, storage, um, transportation, electrification. Um, so please do stop by. As you heard, I'm Sue Gander. I'm with the National Governors Association. I'm part of our Center for Best Practices. And I head up our team that looks at energy, environment, and transportation. And our focus is on state policy making. Um, helping states, helping governors, their staff, other folks at the state level think about strategies that they can adopt to achieve their goals, um, in my case, around energy, around environment, around transportation. So I feel like um, this forum is very much at home for me. Um, I'll just say that I know we're here on Capitol Hill, which is the home of federal policymaking, but my message is that it's the states that are leading efforts to advance and support clean energy across the country. Um, they're doing it across a different, uh, a whole diverse set of resources, resource types, um, and for a variety of different reasons. So I'm going to share with you some of my thoughts on that. Um, so if you're here from Congress, um, part of a staff, um, please do take a look at what states are doing. And uh, I think you might get some good ideas uh, of your own. If you're here from an energy company, definitely get your business case ready because there's lots going on out there. And if you're a consultant, you really need to act quickly because it's an absolute feeding frenzy, I can tell you, um, in terms of helping states think about what they're going to do. Um, I want to note that this past year, National Governors Association has been working intently on issues around clean energy and more broadly energy um, transformation um, as part of what's known as a chairs initiative. So our chair, Governor Brian Sandoval from Nevada, has selected the topic of technology transformation, specifically in energy and transportation, as his theme for the year. And so we've been focused on helping think through what do those issues mean for governors and how can they 
prepare for this new technology that's already um, starting to be with us today. The initiative is called Ahead of the Curve Innovation Governors, and those story maps that I mentioned are, are part of the work that we put together um, to help governors and states think about what their strategies might be. And we looked at six different strategies, um, sort of broadly, looking at supporting technology transformation, modernizing policy processes, just catching up with the technology that is arguably way ahead where the policy making is, preparing and educating the workforce, which we know also has a number of skilled, skills gaps that need to be addressed, updating communications and data systems, really critical, particularly when we think about the digital and connected worlds that energy and transportation are these days, uh, needing that communications network to help transmit that data and take advantage of the technologies. Um, we also looked at addressing cyber threats, along with that increased digitization and connectedness. Um, There's some increased threats um, in terms of um, cyber vulnerabilities, and then educating the public, um, because all this technology really calls for people to do new things in new ways, and um, sometimes that's a little scary. So um, we talked about how can we um, help folks understand the technologies, its benefits, the trade-offs that do come along with, with some of the new technologies as well. So for the past year, we've been meeting with governors, with state officials, industry, technology, thought leaders, um, hearing about what they have to say about the future and, and how governors can play a role. We kicked off the initiative last July with a visit from Elon Musk, who had some startling revelations, as, as only he can make, in terms of the future of technology being increasingly um, electric, solar, nuclear, and automated. Um, so that really got the, the governor's attention. Um, we continue to have conversations with thought leaders like that, and you know, really hearing about how energy sector disruption is upon us, and as we like to say, states are serving as those laboratories of innovation. Um, so I want to share with you a little bit about what we're seeing um, at the state level. Um, I'll start with noting that in this past round of state of the state addresses from the governors, um, of the first 44 that, that spoke, um, 13 of them mentioned specifically renewable energy and some of the goals and targets that they wanted to achieve. Uh, you had folks like Governor Ige from Hawaii who signed a law in, uh, into effect, uh, committing them to 100% electricity for Hawaii by 2045. Um, sorry, 100% renewable energy um, from their electricity sector by 2045. Um, you had, uh, in the middle of the country, uh, Governor uh, Sam Brownback at the time from Kansas, um, talking about his dream of a future Kansas um, exporting wind electricity across America. I think speaking to the economic development goals um, for that state. And then one of our newest governors, Governor Northam from Virginia, speaking about um, the Clean Energy Virginia initiative that he launched to help um, advance renewable energy in that state as well. So governors see these opportunities firsthand. Um, well over half the states have some kind of executive order that they've put into place to promote energy efficiency in their fleets and in their buildings through what we call lead by example actions. You have a number of states that are looking at adopting new electricity business models through what we uh, call power sector modernization or grid modernization. Um, states like California, Colorado, Hawaii, Massachusetts, uh, Minnesota, New York, and, and most recently Rhode Island um, have put forward ideas for how to move to more of a performance-based approach um, to support their utilities and that's in, again, because of the shift to distributed energy resources. Um, you've got a lot of changes also taking place in terms of some of the renewable energy policies that were put in place years ago that um, states feel like they need to be updated. So a number of states have looked at their renewable portfolio standards. They may have extended them, they may have adjusted them, and, and taken on new types of targets as part of that as well. Um, and um, one interesting development that is in response to some of the pushes at the, at the corporate level is you have a number of states, um, 14 by our count, that have adopted some kind of green tariff mechanism whereby companies can um, pay for through, a green, for through a special tariff um, renewable energy to, so, to more or less su supply their needs on the grid. Um, that's because of the many sustainability goals that, that companies have set. Um, and then we're seeing a number of new technologies take hold. I just want to mention a few of them that we've been working with states on. Offshore wind, um, I know that's a topic that's um, under discussion here on the Hill as well. Um, we have the first uh, 
uh, offshore wind site already in place in Rhode Island, and now we have over 8,000 um, gigawatts of planned resources off the Atlantic coast. Um, you've got the first announcement of a um, approval for a site uh, in the Great Lakes by Ohio, um, and we just held a forum with the Danish embassy uh, a few weeks ago and saw a tremendous interest in this both from states interested in the resource and how they can make use of it, um, but also in those, invo those involved in the supply chain and also developing their ports um, to take into account the new development. Storage is another huge game changer. We've seen states across the country taking action, um, setting targets, studying this resource more, thinking about how it can combine with other intermittent resources um, and how it can really help with their resiliency strategies. And then arguably, the hottest topic of all, I would say, is electrification of transportation, so that combining of energy and transportation. You had over 43 states take action on EVs uh, in the last year. Um, so that's a lot of action, and you might ask why. Why are the states so interested? And I just wanted to note there are a variety of benefits um, from economic development to uh, wanting a diverse diverse or more diverse resource mix to achieving lower costs for their electricity, to addressing environmental and health concerns. Um, to uh, responding to those corporate preferences for rene more renewable energy that, ha that I mentioned earlier. Um, and then one that's becoming increasingly important to states is to try to have a more resilient electric grid, uh, particularly in the face of increasing natural disasters and, and other threats to the electric grid. So I mentioned all that, and I am excited to say that we've captured a lot of those stories um, in much greater lengths in two new roadmaps we're going to be putting out later this month. Um, one is on energy innovation, and one is on tech, uh, transportation innovation. If you stop by our booth, again, big plug, um, you can drop your business card in, and we'll get you on the list um, so you can be part of that release. Um, so with that, I'll close, and um, I will stick around uh, later today if you have questions if we happen to run out of time. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joe Heischer. I'm a uh, part-time professor of the practice at uh, the Scott Institute at Carnegie Mellon University. I also work here in Washington as a principal of the uh, nonprofit uh, Energy Futures Initiative. What I wanted to talk to you about today is, in particular, focusing in on manufacturing energy efficiency and some work that we've been doing uh, at the Scott Institute at Carnegie Mellon um, on this topic, looking at uh, some new policy approaches. So let me start off by just sort of setting the stage for you a little bit about U.S. manufacturing. Um, two major uh, trends are underway right now if you look at the U.S. manufacturing sector. The first is just overall growth. Um, uh, the most recent uh, biannual um, uh, survey by the Institute of Supply of the Supply Managers shows that uh, is projecting continued growth in both uh, employment, revenues, and, and in particular, uh, double-digit growth in capital investment and new plant and capital equipment. The other major trend in U.S. manufacturing is the, what I call the transformation of manufacturing, which is what some people refer to as Industry 4.0, as others refer to as the uh, Industrial Internet of Things which simply stated means the uh, application of digitalization to manufacturing uh, processes and plants and what that might mean for uh, you know, future improvements. So the question you might ask yourself, so what does this mean for, for energy efficiency? And essentially, what we're look, uh, from our perspective, what we're seeing is that this is creating potentially a lot of new opportunities, but at the same time means that we also now to be, need to be thinking in new ways about federal policy toward manufacturing uh, energy efficiency. Obviously, the growth of uh, new capital investment means that new equipment will be installed that will be more efficient. A lot of that will have to do with the programs that have been in place over the past decades dealing with uh, uh, efficiency standards and voluntary programs. But at the same time, there's other things going on with Industry 4.0 that I think are, we think are very significant. And so one doesn't necessarily think about uh, Industry 4.0 or digitalization as energy efficiency per se, but in fact, when you think about those trends, 
there are a lot of energy efficiency improvements that are embedded throughout uh, those uh, innovations. So for example, uh, one of the trends in Industry 4.0 is uh, uh, increased use of sensors uh, and big data analytics. And those things uh, create the opportunity in manufacturing to provide for uh, tighter tolerances, greater controls, more predictive maintenance, all of which leads to more production and more productive use of existing equipment without any changeover in the hardware itself. And that, in turn, means that you have greater energy productivity from an existing plant. Another good example, I think, is 3D printing or additive manufacturing. Um, a 3D printer is not an energy efficient machine per se, but it does provide important energy efficiency benefits. Uh, for example, the uh, application of heat is much more precise and much more carefully controlled. Uh, there's no waste material at the end of the process, and by having, uh, you know, uh, final shape uh, formation in the process, you eliminate the need for follow-on machining. All of those things save energy. Um, and so that kind of leads us to our thinking about how, how to proceed on this. And uh, in particular, we think that then energy efficiency policy needs to have a much more of a systems perspective and how it approaches, rather than a component perspective, and how we think about energy um, efficiency policy. Um, the second area that I wanted to touch on as well is looking at the, what this then means for federal uh, manufacturing uh, assistance programs. Within the federal government today, we have a number of federal programs that reach out to provide various forms of assistance, primarily technical assistance, to uh, manufacturers, big and small. Um, in the Commerce Department, we have the Manufacturing Extension Partnerships, uh, which provides a lot of business advice and assistance to manufacturers. In the Department of Energy, we have the Industrial uh, assessment centers, which are largely university-based programs that provide more technical assistance in solving technical problems. And then we've had, in recent years, the growth of what was referred to as the Manufacturing USA Institutes, which are more uh, research and development innovation institutes, some of which are based at universities, some of which are based um, uh, at nonprofits, some of which are connected to DOE national laboratories. And these institutes provide a much more broader perspective on research and development, technology transfer, innovation, and um, workforce training. And then last but not least, we have in both the Department of Energy and in EPA programs to encourage uh, use of combined heat and power at manufacturing facilities. And, uh, and particularly in the case of DOE, they have set up uh, uh, some broad regional centers that provide technical support to uh, manufacturers looking to um, install CHP. What, what this all means then is that when you step back and you look at the trends in the transformation of manufacturing, that a lot of these programs, while they provide important benefits, are more categorical in nature. And what we're looking at is recommendations for how they can be better integrated. There have been some attempts already at looking at integration by, for example, having members of the Manufacturing Energy Partnerships um, uh, connected to individual uh, manufacturing institutes. But we think that there could be a lot more opportunity for integration here, particularly when we want to take more of a systems level perspective. And we want to look at energy efficiency not in isolation, but really as an important component of the overall manufacturing process. Uh, and we think that there may be opportunities in, in, in the work we're doing at the Scott Institute, we're taking a very close look at it at a regional level and what can be done at a regional level to integrate these uh, vertically, uh, this vertical programs. Last but not least, I do want to just say one point about combined heat and power. Um, again, we've been looking at it at a regional level and right now there's roughly uh, two and a half gigawatts of combined heat and power electricity capacity that's installed in manufacturing facilities in the tri-state region of 
Pennsylvania, Ohio, and West Virginia. Looking at some of the DOE data, there's a potential for another uh, 8.9 gigawatts of electricity, which is a, a huge amount of potential new generation that can be gained from combined heat and power. Um, the problem is that it's scattered at a number of facilities, some big, some small, but the good news again is that just looking at some of the larger potential applications, typically 20 megawatts or more, there's probably about 100 facilities in the tri-state region that could provide um, about another three gigawatts of uh, capacity in total. The challenge with combined heat and power is that you're trying to optimize both your thermal and your electricity generation, where your thermal generation has to meet your manufacturing needs and your electricity generation has to be integrated with the grid. And that's where I think, again, there's a need for more federal support, both at a technical level, financial level, and, uh, and at a regulatory level, to uh, encourage more uh, deployment of combined heat and power, particularly working with the smaller manufacturers who do not simply have that kind of expertise. That also means that there may be opportunities as well for new third-party business models to come into play to support uh, manufacturers in that regard. So finally, I just say in conclusion, we're thinking about the idea of, of a broader definition of what constitutes manufacturing energy efficiency and what should go into a manufacturing energy efficiency policy. That it not is just simply the kind of the per unit energy savings, but rather something that really considers manufacturing at a systems level, considers things like energy benefits from product improvements, energy and benefits from process improvements, from productivity improvements, and last but not least, uh, lesser environmental impacts, including reduced uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So this is kind of a work in progress. We're planning to put together a report. We're still doing, uh, finishing up our research on this, and we would very much welcome your ideas. Uh, we have a table outside where we'll have some information, including a, a handout that um, captures some of the information that I just covered. So we would be very interested in talking to any and all of you further about any of these ideas. Thank you. We have some seats open. We have two here. We have about two more here. So feel free to walk in. We have three in the middle over here. So I feel sad for all you people standing up in the back. And by the way, can, uh, it's very hot in here. Do you have any uh, contacts with Johnson Controls? So can, uh, call us down. Uh, our next panelist, right up there, sir. Great. Thank you, Scott. I'm Andreas Kremer. I am the founder and director emeritus of Ecologic Institute in Berlin, Germany, and I'm the chairman of Ecologic Institute here in Washington, D.C. We celebrate our 10th anniversary of the creation of uh, the Ecologic Institute here in Washington, D.C., and the president, Max Grünig, is sitting here in the front row. The role we have as a nonprofit think tank, the largest or second largest in Germany, depending on how you calculate, is to provide evidence for policy learning. We evaluate policies as they work in, very, in the various member states of the European Union, and you, we help the dissemination, the spreading of good policies and the eradication of bad policies. And we do that also across the Atlantic and elsewhere. We bring a German, a European perspective to the debate in Washington, D.C. And in that context, I should say at the outset that I do not take instructions from foreign governments or foreign corporations or indeed anybody else. I'm my free agent. And nothing I say here in these august halls today shall be interpreted as uh, constituting an attempt to influence the legislative process in this country or the outcome of any election. The right. disclaimer you, out of the you way. Mean Putin hasn't called you a person before you showed up here? Okay. Well, there we are. Anyway, um, what you need to understand about the European and the German context is Germany has uh, land borders with nine countries. We have electrical interconnections with all of them. We have wires across the sea to two more, and we're building wires and pipelines across the sea to another one. So we will have interconnections with 12 of our neighbors. That's typical. I guess it's typical for most of the states in the United States as well. Hawaii may be an outlier in that respect. But what it means is that any policy, any public policy that is developed in Germany has an impact on the neighbors. And it is good neighborly policy to tell them about it beforehand. In actual fact, there is a formal process for notifying anything that the government might adopt 
both to Brussels, the European Commission, uh, but also inform uh, the neighbors. What it means is that nothing that happens in Germany is done without the prior um, information going to all our neighbors, and our neighbors don't do anything without us knowing about it beforehand. I don't think that we consider enough um, the interconnectedness of our energy systems and the interconnectedness of our policies. The interconnection is not just in the market and technical, it is also in the thinking. And that is what we as a think tank do, is we evaluate the policies, we tell the stories that work, we tell the stories that make mistakes, that contain mistakes. And let me be clear about that, is um, when you go to seminars like these, everybody talks about their success stories in the hope that they will be copied elsewhere. But you know, when you get the policy practitioners to travel with one another, to look at sites, they sit in the bus. After two beers in the evening, the question comes, and what went wrong? What you, can you tell me about? And it's that story about what went wrong that contains so much information and has avoided so many repetitions of mistakes. It is so important that we keep talking. Enough of that. My invitation to you today is to imagine the world in 2020, uh, 2050. It could be 2060. I don't care about the date. It's about an imaginary endpoint of the shift towards green energy. At that end point, we have 100% renewable energy. No more fossil energy. No coal, no oil, no gas. It's not that far away. It's one and a half generations away. Renewable um, nuclear energy will be reduced to what the technology can be because it is too expensive. It doesn't have a rationale in the energy system. It does have a rationale in military terms. But for that, you don't need an industry that has the size of it today. So imagine how that will go. There will be a lot less trade. We will not be shipping coal and oil. Half of the shipping tonnage miles on the world ocean today are for fossil commodities and products. Half of the shipping tonnage can go away in the next 32 years. Imagine what that means, how many ships we can break up and use the metal for recycling to make wind turbines out of them. Great fun uh, there. There is. On land and on the seafloor, we have a lot, we will have a lot of legacy infrastructure, abandoned stuff. In many cases, the companies that own it today will not be around to dismantle it and to make it safe. It will be a public policy issue to make sure that the oil rigs are removed, that the pipelines are removed, and that the damage to the groundwater and the soil is remediated. We will have a decline in the trade, but also in the contribution of industries to gross domestic product. Why is that? Because the renewable energy is completely different from the fossil energy. In the fossil energy market, we extract the stuff, the coal, the oil, and the gas, and we put it once through the system, and we burn it, and then it's gone. It's once through consumptive use of the resources. All the resources, the lithium, all the rare earths, all the other metals and metalloids that we use for the equipment that we use on renewable, they're durable. They are extracted, they're put into durable equipment. We use it for 20 years, for 40 years, perhaps longer, and at the end of that we will recycle it. Completely different economic rationale. It's not trade once through, but it is for investment purposes. So there will be a lot less throughput in physical terms and a lot less throughput in economic terms as a consequence lower trade volumes, lower tax revenue because there is less business to tax, um, and that will have an effect. Now, some people focus on the destabilization, and you could say that what is happening in Venezuela today is the first petro state going bankrupt because it can't make the money anymore. It's a little bit simplistic, but it's not fundamentally wrong to say it like that. But you also know those of you who have studied political economy, international political economy, the concept of the resource curse, that the extraction of fossil energy um, in any part of the world tends to breed autocratic repressive governments. The resource curse is something that um, uh, can be lifted as a consequence of the shift towards green energy with great long-term effects for freedom. The shift towards green energy is good for freedom all around the world. There's nothing new about that. It's all positive, and I could talk about it for hours. But don't do that. <laughs> <laughs>
I won't, but I will be available on the corridor after the event is over. But when all of this is done, Scott, there is something else that we should keep in mind. There will still be the consequences of global overheating. There will still be the food loss, the protein loss, and the consequences of the acidification of the world's ocean. And we still have the consequences of sea level rise. We need public policies to deal with the consequences as positive as the outlook is on the energy transformation. Thank you very much. Thank you. We still have two chair spaces up here for anybody who wants to sit down and two over here. So feel free to walk up front and to go along with the last speaker. I do have two buildings off the grid, three blocks from the Clarendon Metro stop. I give tours there all the time. You are all welcome. You have to let me know first. I don't want to be woken up, but I do give tours. Next speaker, please. And um, thank you, everyone, for um, your interest in today's forum and this panel specifically. Thank you. Uh, my name is Mary Alice Fisher. I am the Certification Program Director for the Low Impact Hydropower Institute. A lot of words there. Uh, we call ourselves LEHI. I still call myself Mary Alice. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so I want to spend a couple minutes um, telling you a little bit about who we are, what we do, and then why it relates to public policy, and, and some of the people on this panel have touched upon some of the things I wanted to mention as well. So we're an independent nonprofit. Our mission is to improve the health of river systems, since we focus on hydropower. And we, we try to do that by helping hydro projects to reduce their environmental and social impacts. Um, and the way we do that is through encouraging market incentives for hydropower projects to participate in renewable energy markets. So we do this through a voluntary certification program. Hydro project owners come to us. Um, we evaluate their projects against a set of um, key resource area goals and science-based standards. And these goals and standards are designed to ensure protection of eight key resource areas, and that includes um, adequate river flows to protect aquatic habitat, water quality in general, upstream and downstream fish passage, shoreland and watershed protection, threatened and endangered species, cultural and historic resource preservation, and recreational opportunities. So it's very comprehensive. Um, we're unique in the energy industry as a small nonprofit. We were actually formed by a group of environmental organizations about 20 years ago. They recognized they care about rivers. They recognized that hydropower exists and will continue to exist. Um, and they wanted to do something positive. How can we reduce the impacts of hydropower? So over the course of time, they came up with this um, certification program. And that was done um, through collaboration with a wide variety of stakeholders. So now on our governing board, we have a broad cross-section, including representation from environmental NGOs, from the hydro industry, from renewable market experts, and even from state and federal agencies. Um, so our program kind of exists at that intersection. I see like interlocking chains in, in my mind. Um, you have hydro owners who want to sell their power into renewable energy markets. You have consumers who want to buy trusted renewable energy, know that it's actually renewable. You have environmental advocates that want to make sure that renewable energy in, in, or energy in any form is, is clean. Um, and then you have state and federal policymakers who want to make sure that the, their environmental goals are being met through their renewable portfolio standards and, and other programs. So what Leahy did is um, create the first and still only um, standardized definition of low impact hydropower uh, in the country. And the standard definition is really important because it, it, it's sound energy policy de depends on it. So what we have now in some parts of the country, some states and their programs call maybe small hydro projects low impact. Some other states may call only run of river projects low impact. And those are projects that don't have um, impoundment storage. There's some in the hydro industry that feel that projects that have been recently federally or state licensed or permitted or relicensed should be considered low impact because they've gone through a pretty rigorous regulatory process for relicensing. Um, there's others outside the hydro industry who don't believe any hydropower can be low impact by definition. And there's even some who believe that um, 
hydropower isn't even green enough to be called renewable. Seriously. So there's a, a wide variety of perspectives on this. Um, but we recognize, and our program recognizes, that a broad brush approach to trying to define and, and, and affect low impact hydropower can't be done based on size alone, for instance. There's small hydro projects that can have really damaging impacts locally to their local ecosystems. There's very large projects that, that we have certified that have really minimal impacts and they're doing a fabulous job and have made huge improvements in their local river ecosystem. So as I said, our program is based on a set of science-based standards that are you know, defensible, reasonable, understandable, and consistent. Um, we also recognize that every energy project, whether it's renewable or not, including hydro, does have impacts. And that's why we're called low impact hydro, not no impact hydro. That's just not possible. But also our program, through our, our certification program, I'll describe a little bit in a minute, um, is focused on achieving site-specific improvements. Every hydropower project is unique because it's built uniquely into the environment to take advantage of site conditions. And so we focus on positive <coughs> outcomes that are site specific. So our certification process is pretty rigorous. You can just ask our applicants about that. Um, it includes a um, very in-depth written application, submittal of lots of supplemental documentation that we carefully review and real demonstration by the applicant that they're meeting our standards. They have to prove to us that they are truly low impact under our criteria. We have multiple levels of review of those um, applications, including sometimes by our governing board of directors. Um, so it's, it's rigorous. Um, the process is also transparent. Unlike a lot of certification processes for a variety of things, um, we do it in, in, in open public. So our applications, when, when they're accepted by us, um, are posted on our website, announced publicly. Um, we use third-party technical reviewers and their reports that are written to determine whether or not a project is recommended for certification are also publicly posted. There's two formal comment periods. And then we directly also solicit input from state and federal resource agencies just to make sure that the project and what the, there's, the applicant is saying about the project is real and is um, consistent with state resource management goals. So as a, as a result of that um, rigor and transparency, um, low impact hydro certification has become, um, you know, kind of the gold standard. It's become um, a, a trusted source of information for states and, and programs that want to acknowledge hydropower in their, in their programs. So for instance, Massachusetts um, has a renewable portfolio standard that has um, size limits on hydropower, but also environmental thresholds. And when they were last updating the program, they realized that they didn't have the internal capacity budgetized, but budgetary wise or technical expertise to be able to evaluate hydropower projects. So Leahy certification was written into that that state law covering that program. Um, we were not responsible for that, but we're happy about it. <laughs> and in addition to Massachusetts, Oregon and Pennsylvania also have programs that require Leahy certification. Most states do not. They either accept all hydro or small hydro or no hydro. Um, in addition, the Green E program, the National Voluntary Renewable Energy Credit Certification program requires Leahy certification along with other restrictions, as does um, EPA's Green Power Partnership. So these are just examples of energy policies that both recognize that hydropower is renewable and it can be a good clean source of energy, but also under what the benefits that Leahy brings is a, an understanding and a recognition that improvements are being made. And so, and impacts are being reduced at these projects. So what, you know, really sets us apart is, you know, well, like all hydropower, you know, Leahy certified projects are green, um, they're renewable, they're carbon free. Hydro in general puts out about twice as much energy per installed megawatt as wind and solar because water is typically more available than wind and solar. 
So it's important that way. Um, but also, in, and this afternoon is a um, session on renewable energy trends and prospects, I believe. And, and I know there'll be a couple representatives from um, the hydro industry there. And I'd encourage you to attend just to learn more about a whole range of other positive attributes that hydropower has. But as I say, we're focused on site-specific um, environmental and social benefits that particular hydro projects can bring. And, you know, we like to recognize and reward um, our certified projects because these are owners who are responsible and responsive. They commit to long-term improvements and to long-term protections of their local ecosystems. And so we just feel that these hydro projects that have been certified and can demonstrate their lower impact can and should continue to be recognized in the renewable energy markets like other renewables are. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.